Thank you, Pastor Mike. Thank Renee for typing up our texts. And uh, thank Tommy for running this show. Are we having an echo here? Or we're not out in the mountains somewhere, are we? We're, yeah, okay, we'll work it out. Sure. Um, preaching from the Revised Standard Version. And uh, let's see now, the sermon title is The Revelation to Paul. Wasn't a misprint, was it? I thought the revelation was to John. Well, there is a long one to John, isn't there? Right at the very end. So uh, let's don't just stand here. Let's just jump in and see what's happening. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. And Galatians is most likely the oldest document in the New Testament. Probably written about around 50 A.D., maybe only 20 years after Jesus was here on earth. Uh, this is rather powerful. And the Galatian area is kind of uh, the northeast corner above the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, some of the, uh, even the churches in Revelation, some of them are from there. But it's a rather large area and room for plenty of churches. And this is probably 35 to 40 years, Galatians, is probably 35 to 40 years ahead of the book of Revelation at the end of the New Testament. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren, probably Timothy, maybe others, who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. What's grace? Let's see. What did we just sing a while ago? Uh, my sin not in part, but what? Is nailed there? Wow. What kind of a God would treat his son like I deserve to be treated? That's a loving God, isn't it? A God with a big plan and a big heart? Wow. So what God does... My sin deserves to separate me from him and his glorious perfect kingdom, which is what the kingdom of heaven and, and the new earth is going to be. Without any blemish anywhere, man, it would be wonderful to be there. Once we're glorified and sin is removed from us and we're removed from sin, we're kind of used to sin, aren't we? Even the little stuff, sometimes we don't even realize we're so steeped in it. But my sin and myself, we, I deserve to be separated from God and his... Uh, glorious eternal kingdom. But God has placed the righteous punishment for my sin on his son. He has treated Jesus as I deserve to be treated. And you know what? If you could look at my life record, just say right here, uh, rather spotted up badly with sinfulness. When Jesus goes on the cross, he pays for all that, and that dirty record is wiped clean. Now, is that a good thing or what? Glory to God. That slate is now clean. That is God's mercy. Amen? Oh, boy. That is his mercy. This, this, God doesn't stop there. He turns around now and goes from treating his son like I deserve to, that's right, treating me as Jesus deserved. Wait a minute. He treats me as if I had always done everything right, uh, even in thought, word, and deed. Yeah, he does. I cannot merit coming into his perfect kingdom on what I've done. But he treats me, when he saves me and takes me home with him to heaven and the new earth forever, he treats me as if I were his son. I mean, this is just, what kind of words do you use, folks? Way, way up yonder above our comprehension or anything else. Wow. Uh, and when he treats his son like I deserve and he forgives all my sin, that's his mercy. And when he treats me like Jesus deserves, that's the fullness of his grace. And there it is, folks. And that is not of the human realm. You know, we forgive each other. We have relationships so that we have some mercy sometimes and forgiveness. But this grace thing, that's from God only. That's from God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
And there have been many and still are many religions in the world. And I can tell you how many of them you'll find uh, grace. You'll find it here. And you'll find it there. But not anywhere else. Nothing else has Jesus Christ. Nothing else has God the Father and the Spirit. Nothing else has grace. You work your way up in those religions or try to do something to dodge the evil that those pagan gods will bring on you. But nothing has a God who initiates forgiveness and grace like our God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if we're here today and we believe in grace, we've come to the right place. Amen. Amen. Verse 3 again, grace to you and, and peace, and that's, you know, peace is going to follow grace because you're right in God's eyes, man. It can't come before it, but it will follow it. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. See, I wasn't making that up. He gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of, God, of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, this is really something coming up now. Verses 6 and 7. Paul says to the Galatians, after this wonderful introduction, I am astonished, strong word, that you are so quickly deserting him, that would be God the Father, you are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel, not that there is another gospel, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. And look at uh, verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel con contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be what? Accursed? Uh, folks, you don't really see anything quite like this anywhere else. This is powerful. What's Paul so upset about? We'll see. And he repeats it, verse 9, as we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to that which you receive from us, let him be accursed. Well, here was the problem. Some people who claim to be followers of Jesus, and they may have been in a certain way, and they're Jewish Christians, but they've been coming around behind Paul as he traveled sometimes, and they've been to Galatia and telling the Galatian Gentile Christians that, yes, you need to accept Jesus as your Savior, but if you really want to be saved, you, you men have to be circumcised too. Oh, by the way, you have to separate yourself from those who are not circumcised. That's in chapter 2. And in chapter 4, we read, Paul says, you've started keeping special days and all that kind of stuff again. Once you introduce the law and say, well, you, in, in addition to keep, uh, loving Jesus and receiving his salvation, you have to also do this yourself. Once that begins, it'll never stop. They'll keep adding more and more of the law until you'll be back under the law like you were before. And I think it's safe to say that Paul does not agree with this. Let's look at this in a little nutshell of what he says in chapter 2. Uh, Tommy's right ahead of me, man. Chapter 2, yes, brother. That was supposed to be a compliment and, and a thank you. Chapter 2, verse 15. We ourselves who are Jews by birth, as he was, and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a man is not justified by works of the law. Uh, you can, I can kind of picture an angel wondering, how can God justify letting me into heaven, his eternal kingdom? That's a, that would be a good question. A man who sinned, a man who's been self-centered, how can you justify bringing him into a perfect kingdom? Well, because Jesus has paid the price. And, and now God treats me just as if I, we kind of have a little play on words, God treats me just as if I had never sinned. Wow, there you go. And in addition to that, he treats me just as if I had always done everything right because Jesus' righteousness comes on me. Okay, we know, verse 16, that a man is not justified, made right with God by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law because work by the works of the law shall no one be justified. Whew. Paul gets on a roll and man, 
Two verses, Paul says three times, nobody, three times in two verses, nobody will be justified by works of the law. And in those same two verses, he says twice, you're justified by what Jesus did. And there it is. Never do you combine the two. You don't need to add what we've done to what he's done. You know, Paul, Paul was a young Pharisee named Saul who hated Jesus so much at one time and thought Jesus was so evil. Boy, it was good when he was crucified and he got rid of him. He didn't know about the resurrection yet or didn't believe it if he heard a rumor. Paul hated Jesus and what he stood for, what they, he thought Jesus stood for so much that not only was it good that Jesus was gone, it's time to go after his followers and wipe them out. Either imprison them or kill them too. Wow. Wow. And so we, we have a record of him standing there as men lay their cloaks on him so they can loosen up and better throw stones at Stephen and kill him. This is not nice, folks. You think you would ever forget standing there and watching uh, and hearing stones go into the bone and, and flesh of another human being until he fell over dead and then just kept throwing him until he was covered up? You think you'd forget that? No, you wouldn't. Paul realized, what law could he go out and keep to make up for that? Could he bring Stephen back? He knows better. He's the perfect man with his Jewish background who really knows the Old Testament and has failed as miserably as he has. He's the perfect man to receive the gospel. And so he knows there's no work you can do to make up for the sin you've done. And then there's this. Back to Galatians 1, verses, yes, 11 and 12. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel which was preached by me, it's not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from a man, nor was I taught it, but it came through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah, through a revelation of Jesus Christ. Luke tells us in the book of Acts that Jesus himself personally appeared to Paul four times. The first was on the road to Damascus, as we know. Who are you, Lord? This light tremendous light from heaven. Jesus is close by. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And he appeared to him at least three more times. If you want to look him up, you can. It's in Luke 18. I mean, I'm sorry, Acts 18, Acts 22, and Acts 23. And in Acts 23, what Luke writes is that that night, Jesus came, came, and stood beside Paul. Wow. But 20 years ago, Jesus rose from the dead, ascended to heaven, has become our high priest. And yet there he is coming to stand beside Paul in bodily form. Now, folks, with, you look at the Old Testament, it was wonderful from the Lord, better than anything around it in the world. And then the new goes way above it with the power of the gospel. Even in that realm, the New Testament, this appearance by uh, the four appearances by Jesus to Paul, that's still to be considered extraordinary. You better believe it. That's what it says. I received it from a revelation of Jesus Christ. You can read those others to see what it says there. And I know we've read this before. It was only about two weeks ago when I realized I was going to be preaching this week that, that I read this again, and it just hit me for what it really is. Uh, yes, extraordinary to say the least. And kind of wonder why, but if you think about this, folks, Jesus has been gone for 20 years. People have been spreading word about him, his life and his death, and there was news of the gospel, but there was nothing set yet in writing. Yes, as, uh, as was it Mike a while ago saying? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John contained the teachings, but they hadn't been written yet. They hadn't been written until many years after this revelation. And there's a network of people going out from Jerusalem to spread the, the good news, but without the communication and the, uh, the ease of uh, communication and travel we have today, there was only so much that could be done. But a network has been set up over the 20-year period since Jesus left 
But now they need a gospel that can be shared with everybody. And what is that gospel? Is it too much of this, too little of that? And so the Lord Jesus comes and appears to Paul with the basics of the gospel. I, we don't know how much. We don't know exactly. But if you believe Paul, and I tend to believe him, the Lord came and taught him what we have. Wow. And uh, we're in a, a master class uh, from the teachings of Jesus. I think we better include this. What do you think? Yeah, this is a unique one, that's for sure. Praise God. And uh, again, we're just not justified by works, but, we, but by what Jesus did. And uh, we'll go into more of it in a little bit. The sad thing is that most people, even who've heard the name Jesus and who know some of the commandments and stuff like that out in the world, and that's millions and millions of people do. They aren't religious, they don't go to church, but they've still heard those things. They do not know the truths of the gospel. And uh, there are some folks in church who don't either. We don't want to be any of them. We don't. And I, well, I didn't come in here and preach today because I think there are people here who don't know it, although we never know for sure who might be visiting or something like that. But even if we do know it, ah, we need to feed on it at times. We need to feed on it. Let me tell you this true story. Years ago, I had a friend named Bob who I actually worked for him. He had an extremely important job with lots of people under him. I was it. It was temporary for me, and I was kind of on the bottom, okay? But he befriended me anyway. He was the very definition of a southern gentleman. I guess that's a politically incorrect term these days, isn't it? But I like it, and I wish we had more people like him. Well, his health wasn't good, and he was quite a bit older than me. He retired, and soon after that, I, I went into the ministry. And one day, we met in a, in a store about a year after we had last been together. And he said, Frank, I've been meaning to call you, and now I can just ask you right here like this, will you be my pastor? Can I consider you to be my pastor? He said, I haven't been to church, and I haven't had a pastor for a while. Will you be my pastor? And I said, I'd be honored. And we met again, and we talked on the phone over the next seven or eight months mostly about his declining health. And then he called me from the hospital, uh, far away actually, and asked me to come visit him the next week. He was having certain procedures which were meant to help his really failing health. And I told him I would come the next week and visit, but it sounded so urgent that I didn't want to wait to, to, for the actual face-to-face -face visit to ask him this question. I said, Bob, if something would happen to you in the meantime, and your life would end, I said, uh, what's your relationship to the Lord? How do you stand with him as far as salvation goes? And he said, uh, well, Frank, I've tried to live a good life, and I, I, I think that I have. And then he kind of chuckled, and he said, but you can never know for sure if that's good enough, can you? Yeah, and he chuckled again and said to me, he said, yeah, Frank, he said, I, I'm certain that you know you can never be sure, can you? He said that to me ministry here's the thing folks Bob had had a strong church upbringing as a boy a youth and a young adult I won't go into the detail but we've all had some maybe all haven't anymore his was extra strong his was really powerful his upbringing in the church I don't know what the middle part of his life was like we didn't go into that although I don't think it was ever terrible because he was a good man with a, an important job and he did a good job. But here he comes up to the end of his life, the last couple of weeks, and he does not know the New Testament gospel. How is that possible? I don't have the answer to that question. I don't. But I tell this story for a couple of reasons. Uh, we better not take for granted that because somebody has a church background or church attendance, that they're saved. We better not take it for granted either that uh, they even know the process of salvation, how we receive it. Obviously, he didn't. And I firmly believe this, folks, and I've heard other people say very similar things. I think there are tens of millions of people out there, maybe decent people in our country. If you ask them the same question I asked Bob, you're going to get almost the identical answer because that's what people that's our natural self in this world, isn't it? 
we're raised off, you're a good boy, you get this reward, if not spanking, or you stand in the corner or something like that. Even as we grow up, this kind of thing continues. And then there are a lot of people who have heard about Jesus and, and, and know that maybe some of the Ten Commandments, well, let's see here. You shall not kill. Well, I've never killed anybody. Uh, you, you shall not commit adultery. Well, way back I used to run around, but I've never been unfaithful to my wife. Thou shalt not steal. You know, I haven't been perfectly honest, but I've never actually taken something that wasn't mine. You see, people with that casual approach, they don't go back to... Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, do they? For Jesus says, if you've hated somebody in, in your heart, you've broken that thou shalt not kill commandment right there. And if you've lusted after somebody, uh, you've been unfaithful. Well, you've been unfaithful to God and your wife too. You've committed adultery in your heart. Ouch. And uh, even if we don't follow through on these things, even although... If we keep them in our hearts and we get along with the person we really don't like or the person we like too much in another way, who knows what could happen. But even if we don't go that far and we hold the hatred and the lust, that's corruption inside of me if I'm the one doing that. Can that spirit of, of corruption be allowed into God's perfect heaven? Of course not. It shouldn't be. It's that which has ruined the world now. Amen? Amen. No, no, that has to be left out of God's kingdom. Well, those commandments, the first, the Ten Commandments, you notice nine of them are negative? It's like our sinful selves are, are leaning in a direction where you want to get mad at somebody or you want to take some, man, I'd like to have that, or, well, she, well, all this stuff. Our, our sinful nature is already leaning in a certain direction, and the most elementary way to teach right from wrong is to say no to that, like we do with a child. These commandments were given to Israel when they came out of Egypt. They had never had any freedom to learn, so they're being taught like children. And I might add, whoever we are and how sophisticated in some ways we might be, at some point in our experience going toward the Lord, we need to hear the thou shalt nots too, folks. Yeah, we really do. Yeah. Because that human nature is right there ready to, to go forth in sin. And so, no, no. We don't stop there, though. To a later generation, God gave a new commandment, actually two commandments, which reveal the exalted nature of his kingdom. Let's, let's look at those commandments in uh, Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12. Starting in verse 28. And one of the scribes came up and heard them, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, disputing with one another, and seeing that he, Jesus, answered them well, the scribe asked Jesus, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is here, Shema, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And then there's a second like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Wow. So now, instead of in the Ten Commandments telling, all, telling us all we better not do, he's telling us how to live and what we need to do. Amen? What we need to have on the inside and carry it out on the outside. By the way, what is love? Love is uh, being some, about something other than self, isn't it? Loving God, you're doing what he wants. Not going your own way, you're doing what he wants. And, and treating your neighbor, putting them equal with yourself. Uh, the opposite of that, folks, is uh, not hatred. We realize that? The opposite of this love is not hatred. It's, it's self. Self-centeredness, selfishness, self. Now, if self doesn't get what it wants, yeah, irritation will rise up. Anger, and then what? Hatred, yeah. 
but it arises from being self-centered because love is going this way and self is coming this way. Mm. And when we realize that and we look at this, uh, and, and notice what he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And if it's all, uh, wouldn't that mean all the time? From the, right from the start, wouldn't it? How can it be all if it's not all the time? You know what, folks? There's no wiggle room and no, no room for casual sin here at all, is there? Well, this is the perfection of God's eternal, blissful kingdom in heaven and on the new earth. Wow. And you know what? If I'm honest, the idea of living a good life, it's good enough to earn that. <sighs> not going to happen. By the way, if we could earn another, if we could earn a hereafter with the way we live now, <laughs> wouldn't it probably be a world a whole lot like this one? I've had enough of it, and I've had enough of sinful stuff here too. I'm looking forward to that one. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your affection your soul, your choices. God has made us in his image and give us freedom to follow him or not, to choose good or bad, right or wrong. Wow. Uh, and what we put into our minds should be something he wants there instead of what we want. And those things are all on the inside and then we're to live it out, all your strength in, in, the, in the world. Back in the Garden of Eden, they had everything. The Gar Eden means delight, the Garden of Delight. Life must have been wonderful, must have been beautiful. And God says, one thing, don't eat of that tree. Trust me. And really, he's giving them free choice when he says that, isn't he? Everything else is good. Everything they do is fine. But he's giving them a choice there. All you got to do is leave that alone. Well, the tempter eventually says to Eve, God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows that when you do, you'll be wise and you'll be like him. Oh, man. And Eve fell for it. And she let herself be deceived. And obviously, she put self ahead of God. And she ate and she sinned. Now, you can read this yourself sometime. In 1 Timothy, Paul says that Eve was deceived, but Adam was not. She's the transgressor. That's what Paul says. You get the idea that if Eve hadn't, hadn't sinned and eaten that fruit, Adam never would have. But when she eats, what does he do? He eats also. Why? We aren't told, but it must have been some powerful, compelling reason to cause him to do that. Now let's think about what we have. This is happening with the temptation in the fall in Genesis 3. Go back to the end of Genesis 2. God creates Eve and brings her to Adam, and Adam just goes, Whoa. The language that he uses to, to say how he feels in the Hebrew is so ecstatic, it does not translate well into English. Uh, you know, you, the only way, thing you could do is take exclamation points and just keep putting them after everything he says about Eve. And there's no lust here, folks. There's no sin in the world. This is righteous. Wow, powerful romantic love. And we don't know, but so many people believe that there was a compelling reason for him to eat that fruit at that point. It was probably because he made the choice not to follow his heart of love for God, which he had. He chose to follow his heart for Eve. We don't know that for certain. Very likely, though. We don't know it for certain, but we do know this for certain. He went away, he went a, a direction that was not toward God and was not of God. He did not love God with his heart that day. And that's not going to turn out well. Oh, it's romantic though, isn't it? <laughs> Maybe the Hallmark Channel will make a movie about that. <laughs> but if they read the rest of the story, Maybe not. Because the next thing that happens after they eat the fruit, 
the glory of God goes off of them. There's, they feel naked, guilty, ashamed, and they go hide. The next thing after that, and it's all the same day, the Lord God comes walking, as the Hebrew suggests was his custom, come walking with Adam and Eve in the evening and the beautiful animals, who knows what all was there, to spend time with them. But this time when he comes, he doesn't see Adam because Adam's hiding. And God says, Adam, have you eaten of the tree of which I told you not to? Do we remember Adam's answer? The woman that you gave me, she gave me the fruit, and that's why. Romance is gone, isn't it, folks? You know, God created Adam to be a man. Not much of a man right there. When you go another way other than God, in your heart, your soul, your mind, it's not going to turn out well. Boy, that's a prime example, isn't it? Well, I'm going to quit uh, picking on Adam, though, and look at myself. Uh, when I really see these commands for what they are, love God with everything you have all the time from the start, and then I look at my own life, especially if I go back to before I was saved at age 27 and a half, and I, I ask myself this question. Uh, Frank, did you, uh, did you ever put self ahead of God in the things you let into your heart where you, where you followed your heart? Did you ever put self ahead of God? How about in the things you let into your mind and kept in your mind? Did you ever put self ahead of God there? Uh, how about the choices you made with the power to choose that he gave you made in his image? Did you ever uh, choose things that were not him and put self ahead? And then did you ever live it out in your life you put self ahead? You know, if this is a test, I'm, I don't have much of a score. A more realistic question would be this. Frank, did you ever not put self ahead of God? Yeah. Maybe I did a handful of times before I was saved. I wouldn't doubt if there wasn't a selfish motive underneath some of that. Now, I've done better since I've been saved, glory to God, because he begins the process of sanctifying us, right? It's the work of a lifetime, and it's sometimes a slow climb. One thing's for sure, I'm not earning my way into heaven with my sanctified life. Oh, no. That's given to me because of what Jesus did. Wow, praise God. Do we see it, folks? You know, when I look at that, and I look at those commands, and I look at myself, I'm ready to run for help. Uh, after Galatians comes Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Let's all run back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2, okay? Praise God. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Started at verse 8. For by grace you have been saved. And what was that again? See, hey, God, I don't deserve to be part of God's beautiful eternal kingdom, but God has, has put on his son what I deserved, and my record is, is, is made clean. That's God's mercy. And then he does more than that. Now he, he takes Christ's life and credits that to me and that's yeah grace here we are for by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing it is the gift of God not because of works lest any man should boast and we'll come to verse 10 in a little bit by the way when I made that visit to Bob in the hospital I started out we looked at uh, John three sixteen, and I asked him to read it and I, and I honestly I think he recited it more than he read it I said, Bob, in that verse, I said, who's doing the giving? Uh, are we supposed to uh, live many good years and then we come to God giving him a wonderful life and thereby earn our way? No. God so loved the world that he what? Oh, he gave. He does it. And then we spent most of our time right here in Ephesians too, also some in Romans. And when he said, God does the giving, doesn't he? Then he added this. He said, Frank, I don't believe I ever thought of it like that before. He said that at least two more times. And he said two or three other times, Frank, I don't believe I ever heard it like that before. 
The wonderful thing about Bob was he was humble. You know, a lot of people who had been up here as a boss and somebody's down here, they wouldn't uh, want that person to become their pastor where they're now looking up to them. That didn't bother Bob at all. He received it like a child. It was a wonderful thing to see. We only had about 20 minutes there in intensive care together. And right before I left, he said, Frank, you've given me so much to think about and pray about. And I said, I'll be praying, praying with you, praying for you, Bob. And I'll be back at the end of next week for the, another visit. When I went back, folks, he was so bad off by then that he was in and out of consciousness. Uh, but when he was conscious... All he did was praise the Lord and thank God for his salvation and talk about how thankful we ought to be and he was lying there dying and he knew it. And he, only, he lived less than a week. And he had his right mind when he was conscious. That dry wit that was uniquely his, that was there too. Isn't God wonderful, folks? He couldn't just let Bob go, could he? Wow, that's a God of love. <laughs> who will provide. That's a God of love. Okay, let's look at Ephesians a little more closely here. Uh, you notice how Paul puts a sentinel, a special soldier guard in front of the main statement, and he puts another special sentinel after the main statement, and the main statement is, it is, salvation is the gift of God. For by grace you have been saved through faith. First sentinel. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You know, you'd have to fight your way through there somewhere to corrupt that statement, wouldn't you? And yet, unless you know the Lord, unless you have come to a place where, where you feel desperate and you submit yourself to the Lord, you think somehow you, you must earn your way into the kingdom. Uh, let's see, here at Mount Carmel Academy, is there kindergarten here? Okay. In kindergarten, do you have to teach the kids the difference between is and is not? Or do they come in there knowing that at age five? Yeah. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It is not of works. Anybody not get it? Please don't raise your hand. It is the gift of God. It is not of works. Now, sometimes a preacher on TV will say something like that and then ask the congregation to repeat it. Would you like me to do that? The is and the is not? Well, I won't. If you behave yourselves the rest of the way, I won't. But how plain could it be, folks? Do we really believe it? You know, it's so, it's too good to be true. And in the human realm, yeah. It's too simple to be real. We make the great exchange. He puts on Jesus, my, my sin, and then he puts on me, his righteousness. That's too simple to be real. In the human realm, yeah. I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus himself went to tell Paul. Because it is so overwhelmingly such good news <clears throat> that he needs to hear it from the source to be able to believe it. This thing is so big, so beyond our comprehension. Think of it, folks. You and I, who don't deserve to spend eternity with God, can and will. How could a man, how could... Again, Jesus was God's gift, wasn't he? He was the means of, of our atonement, Amen. So isn't it fitting that he's the one that comes and tells Paul? Yeah. I think it was probably necessary in order for him to be able to receive the gospel. Here's the thing. We have 2,000 years of Christian tradition by now. And most of us grew up or we've been in church a long time. We sort of take it for granted. That, that didn't exist back then. There were sayings of Jesus, things that he did and said, kind of not really uh, in any order or, or a good arrangement. There were those sayings, we think, floating around between the time Jesus went to heaven and between the time Paul started taking the gospel everywhere. But there was some point at which the gospel had to begin to exist as it is today. Amen? Right there it is. 
Sometime before this, it had happened with Paul because he says, I got it from a revelation. And one more time, it's like it's, it's so big, it's so beyond us, it's hard for us to, to, to really believe sometimes, isn't it? And really hard to grasp. But if we believe Paul, and I tend to do that, whether I feel it or comprehend it or not, the gospel is real and true. And my sin has been taken care of with God's mercy. And now I've been made righteous forever because of God's grace. Whether we feel it or not or comprehend it or not, do we believe it? Anybody here believe it? Okay. Uh, salvation is not about what I've done. It's what God does. He's that good. Salvation is not about who I am. That's who God is. God is love. How do you love sinners? You're gracious to them. Praise God. 11.53 a.m. Do I have time to go to Exodus to finish up before 12? Okay, let's go to Exodus 25. Just a couple of verses, and we'll be done. I promise. Oh, I didn't read verse 10. I'm sorry. We, can't, we got to go to verse 10 back in Ephesians. You know, it's so much about what God has done to save us. We might be tempted to say, well, doesn't the good life matter at all? Uh, yes, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship, created, like recreated in Christ Jesus for what? Good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's see. We're created in Christ Jesus for what kind of works? And what does it say in verse 9? We're not saved not because of what? Oh, it doesn't say good works in verse 9, does it? What does that mean? We're always terrible? No. We may bless somebody, help somebody with something that's temporary. But good here is used to represent that which is of God and will last forever. Everything we do for somebody here that's apart from God and the gospel will eventually go away. And so will all of us. Let's see, if I've never been saved and received the Holy Spirit, can I, do I have the Spirit to lead somebody else to the Lord? No. If I'm not part of the kingdom of God, can I help somebody else become part of the kingdom of God? No. So it's only when we receive the free gift through grace, folks, of salvation, that our works really start to move in that direction and can be called good works. How about that? Oh, boy, there's a lot here, isn't there? All right, Exodus 25. What in the world are we doing way back there in the law? Just a little bit to finish up. This is who God has always been. Exodus 25, verse 8. Speaking about his people Israel. Now let's see, Israel was enslaved in Egypt. He, he brought them out of slavery, which they could never have done themselves. He has chosen them. He's put his love on them. Uh, when the Egyptians came after him, he took them through the Red Sea. They couldn't have done that themselves. And then we're in the, they're in the wilderness. He feeds them with manna. There's always this rock wherever they go that, they're, that they can drink from, their flocks and herds. They're in the wilderness wandering. The sun is bright. The, cloud, uh, 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 the pillar of cloud comes over them to shield them from the sun during the day. It comes down around their camp to, to keep out wild animals and maybe people at night. Wow, this is a God who, who's taking care of these folks, isn't it? Oh, by the way, that generation in the wilderness that he takes such good care of, they're the ones who failed and wouldn't trust him. Now, is that grace or what, folks? Wow, way back there, way back there. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. They shall make me an ark. And it was going to be about uh, two and a half feet wide, four feet long, two and a half feet deep. An ark of Akasha wood. Uh, and verse 11, and you shall overlay it with pure gold. Now, that would have been wonderful. And you're going to put some things in it. The Ten Commandments that were written with the finger of God. A jar of manna was added later. Uh, Aaron's rod, which God calls to have a dead stick from which he made uh, living buds grow to show that he had given authority to Moses and Aaron and Miriam. So uh, there's going to be a name for that ark. And there's going to be a top put over it, which is like a throne for a king to sit on. And God doesn't have a body back there, but still, people understood a throne and a seat. So what's he going to call uh, 
this top that's put on the ark. It could be called the commandment seat or the provision seat or the seat of authority, but what does God call it? Verse 21, and you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark. And in the ark you shall put the testimony I give you, the commandments, and then the other things later. Now, where can a holy, righteous, eternal God meet with people who are not holy, righteous, or eternal? It has to be at a place of mercy, does it not? Or, they'd be, or they, we would be consumed. So he meets them at the mercy seat. One final thing, and we don't want to let this go. Verse 22, there I will meet you from above the mercy seat, from between the two angels, the cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony. From there above the mercy seat, uh, seat, I will speak with you of all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. And there were going to be over 600 of them, folks, before it was over. And where are they going to receive all these commands about how to go out and obey him? From where? Above the mercy seat. You just don't meet him there for forgiveness and then you move on somewhere else. From there, above the mercy seat, I will speak of you with all I will give you in commandment. So we don't want to let that principle of the connection between obedience to his commands and him still being at the mercy seat, we don't want to let that be broken. You see, as long as we meet him at the mercy seat, if we get new commands and we fail, we're still meeting him where? at the mercy seat. He still loves us, will forgive us, help us do better. And if we go out and we start really to grow in the Lord and live righteously, we won't get puffed up because when we go to meet him, where are we going to meet him? Oh yeah, at the mercy seat. And I still need his mercy no matter how sanctified it seems that I come. Do we get that, folks? I'm convinced that if Israel had maintained that principle of tying together and never let there being a disconnect between them learning to try to obey God and meeting him at the mercy seat, their history would have been far different. Far different. And think of the leadership when Jesus was here. He came and said, I'm the way, I'm the gift. That's how you, that's how you get into heaven with my Father. They wouldn't because of their self-righteousness. They had obviously lost the connection between living for him, fulfilling his commandments, and meeting him at the mercy seat in our devotions, and we need them, don't we? We need devotion or time with the Lord. Let's make sure we meet him at the mercy seat. And as we learn to grow in him, the next day let's meet him again at the mercy seat. Don't let that connection be broken. We'll never 